Welcome to From the VC's Bookshelf, a podcast from TBR, the College System of Tennessee, the state's largest higher education system. In this series, we examine how we might re-envision the work we do and how we work together as we move into a post-pandemic world. Please join our host, Dr. Heidi Lemming, Vice Chancellor for Student Success, as she leads a live discussion with industry experts and leaders throughout our system. Hello, and welcome to the Tennessee Board of Regents inaugural podcast series discussing themes from the book, Disruptive Transformation, Leading and Creative, or sorry, Leading Creative and Innovative Teams in Higher Education. This show is the third in a three-part podcast series focused on learning from higher education and industry leaders on how to build and cultivate creative teams in higher education as we move past disruptive forces. As introduced by the authors of the book, disruptive transformation is the process of becoming a creative and innovative leader. It involves an individual not only changing others and organizations, but also themselves. It requires leaders to let go and say yes and to the opportunities that lie ahead. In today's episode, we'll discuss transformation from the viewpoint of what external stakeholders like industry and government leaders expect of higher education. Today's panelists represent a breadth of perspective from a technology business leader to the former vice chancellor for the TBR system, or sorry, chancellor of the, well, vice chancellor and chancellor actually, of the TBR system. So let me introduce today's panelists. Our first panelist is David Gregory, former chancellor of the Tennessee Board of Regents. He served with the Tennessee Board of Regents as a vice chancellor for administration and facilities development for 20 years. As Vice Chancellor, Gregory oversaw government relations, institutional advancement, and facilities development. In that role, he spoke to the interests of TBR and its institutions as the key legislative liaison to the Tennessee General Assembly and represented the system to the executive branch of state government. A veteran public administrator, Gregory joined the TBR in May of 1998 after serving as Director of Government Affairs for Blue Cross Blue Shield for three years. He held leadership positions in state government for 15 years prior, including terms as Chief of Staff for Governor Ned McWhorter and Chief of Staff for Lieutenant Governor John Wilder. He is a graduate of Lipscomb University. Thanks for being here. Makes me, makes me sound old. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> And we're also joined by Maria Saab. Currently, uh, she serves as senior manager for Amazon Web Services in the state. Amazon's, it's Amazon's cloud computing business. Her portfolio is focused specifically on the southeastern United States. Prior to working at Amazon Web Services, Maria served as a senior policy analyst at Deloitte. She holds a JD from the George Mason, George Mason University School of Law and received her Bachelor of Arts in International Studies at Virginia Tech. Go Hokies. Yeah. <laughs> I feel that. Yes. As a fellow Hokie. <laughs> All right. So before we dive in, uh, let me recap to our listeners where we've been in this podcast series already. Our first podcast looked at the topic of institutional transformation from the lens of presidential leadership, and our second podcast took a deeper dive in talking about transformation from the perspective of two student affairs leaders with a spectrum of experience that represented not only seasoned professionals who reflected on things that have changed within our profession over time, but also new professionals who provided some insight into what today's entering professionals expect and desire of teams and leaders, uh, particularly as we work with a changing student population. So today we're gonna to explore this topic from the lens of those who are partners with higher education, specifically industry and government leaders, and hear perspective of expectations for how um, we educate and train students for the workforce of tomorrow. So I'm really excited to hear your perspectives um, that both of you have on this. Um, but before we dive in with my questions, I think it's really important for our listeners to understand um, the relationship that TBR has, the partnership with AWS, and also what AD AWS is, the cloud computing. So, Maria, you want to explain that? A yes. Bit? Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's wonderful to be here in Tennessee. I, I just left Tennessee three months ago, so happy to be kind of home again. 
Um, as uh, Dr. Lemming mentioned, I represent Amazon Web Services, which is Amazon's cloud computing business. Um, you all get to use AWS all the time, and you probably don't even know it. But um, if you are using Netflix, you are using AWS. If you watch the NFL, you are using AWS. If you bank with Capital One, you're using AWS. And uh, some of our government services here in Tennessee all are uh, leveraging AWS as well. Um, and as Heidi mentioned, we are really proud of the partnership we have with TBR, um, and I'll explain that. Um, cloud computing is um, a really foundational technology today, and especially in this post-pandemic era, we saw that the move from physical to digital really required um, a new and innovative way to engage people. Um, the way that Amazon got into cloud computing is that about 18 years ago, um, we were working to improve the experience on Amazon.com. I'm sure you all are on Amazon quite a bit over the, uh, the year and especially in this time of the holidays, but we were really focused on getting a customer experience that allowed you to surf the platform or the store um, with ease without having to face um, really slow download times that would allow you to purchase and provide your financial or you know home information to facilitate that purchase and also maintain um, security. Uh, it's also very important that when at this peak holiday time, we can handle a lot of site traffic and we're a global company, so traffic is global. Um, and from there, we developed a back-end infrastructure, information technology infrastructure that enabled it. Um, Amazon is a very customer-obsessed uh, company, and so we thought, we have something cool and interesting here, let's take it to market. So flash forward 18 years, and uh, we have millions of active customers worldwide using AWS, and um, we're still growing. It's very early days in the cloud computing world, um, which is probably crazy to think about since it's been 20, almost 20 years. Um, the best way to think about what cloud computing is, it's the Lego blocks of technology. It's the uh, provision of IT resources over the internet. And what's so great about cloud is it's all done at scale, um, which helps to lower costs immensely. I mean, I think, um, I think we're, you know, we're at a community college, a lot of students are typically younger, but they don't remember that computers came in these giant packages with you know, servers <laughs> and software that hid in a custodian's closet and you'd need to call some guy from 20 miles away to you know, fix it up and upgrade the software and the virusware. But all of that's now done over the internet. Um, and through hyperscale cloud providers like AWS, we take all that burden away from you. So um, we're supporting customers, private sector, public sector, government, you know, the, the guy in, or gal in the garage with an idea or someone who wants to store their crazy cat photos for all of time, but mm -hmm. um, it's really great work. Um, this year, um, I had the privilege of joining the Tennessee Board of Regents and announcing a partnership to skill 5,000 learners in the state for free on AWS cloud computing curriculum. Um, we're delivering that content through the TBR network um, and allowing students to uh, achieve stackable credentials and certificates to make them cloud-enabled themselves. Uh, cloud computing skills are high in demand, and I'll talk about that more but um, we just rolled out sort of the first cohort through the um, TCAT um, system here, and we're really excited about the work that we're doing. And um, there's really great focus also on the institution, not just the student. We're working with instructors, we're working on curriculum, and so uh, we're really excited. Yeah, and that's exactly why I have you here today, because we're <laughs> going to talk a lot about like how you know we're partnering with others you know, on the curriculum uh, to support um, industry needs, but also the future workforce, right? Yes. When we think about what students are interested in pursuing yes. uh, as entrepreneurs, potentially. Great. So, okay. So let's let's dive in. Um, in 2020, the Brightline Project Management Institute partnership um, that they have with Thinkers 50 released a report called Transforming Beyond the Crisis. And it challenged readers to think about how to reimagine business to survive and what needs to be done now in order to seize tomorrow. Through a compilation of thinking from the world's leading business thinkers and practitioners, the contributors remind us that transformation has to be part of an organizational agenda. 
And most people resist change in organizations. So you have to think about how do you enable people to be nimble and move in strategic ways very quickly. And so my first question, Maria, if you could um, speak to this is, you know, how um, has your organization kind of made this kind of thinking part of your culture at the organization? You know, what are the actionable ways that you make this happen? Perhaps that higher education could borrow from when we think about um, being more nimble. Yeah, um, that's a really great question. Um, Amazon, at Amazon, we say we have a really peculiar culture. Um, and I think that peculiarity has enabled us to grow and scale in unbelievable ways. I, I often joke when I introduce myself about what my job is, I say I work for a small online bookstore. <laughs> and uh, then I say Amazon and people think I'm nuts. But um, at Amazon, we our culture is driven by a set of leadership principles. And the first one is customer obsession. At Amazon, we innovate for the individual need and everyone's needs are changing. But if we believe that if we answer to an, one individual's need um, through an innovation or a cool service, whether that's you know AWS or two-day prime shipping or Amazon Video, um, we're going to be able to help others. And so that's kind of where we start. Um, one part of that's a, the, I'm sorry, let me go back there. The, once we start that process, we really focus on being nimble. We have um, a sort of ethos around a two pizza team that the folks that come together to innovate um, must be served by only two pizzas. So those are really small teams if you think about it. And then we also focus on things like two-way door decisions, one-way door decisions, and that helps kind of ground us in our expectations. A two-way door decision is, you know, you might be able to move directionally in one way, but know that you can kind of reiterate or um, iterate or come back from it. A one way is we're gonna take a plunge. And that kind of leads to one of our other leadership principles, which is around failure. Um, we're not deterred by failure. We see failure as an opportunity to learn. And I think that enables us also to continue to be nimble. Um, one way that I think that that can be applied in the higher ed is you know, customer obsession is can be focused around student obsession. What do students need to be most successful? Um, and you know, you brought up that you had student leaders in the second episode that mm -hmm. were providing perspectives on their experiences and the job market. Um, you know, I think for a, a lot, a long time, there's been a little bit of a mismatch around the job market and education, um, and they haven't been talking too much, and so. What we're learning at Amazon um, that applies in the higher ed situation, especially through the work we get to do with TBR, is that um, we have to provide learning materials that focus on the student and, and the institution. How We have to make that our, our focus point. But that has to also be informed by what the employers need, and there has to be a connection. There has to be some success for the student in the outside market, and so we bring that together. Um, we work in these small groups with um, our academic partners to iterate and learn and apply that kind of innovation, and I think um, that's useful even as universities or community college systems start to think of new ways to build out um, curriculum that supports student growth. Yeah, that's great, because I think a lot about today's college student and they're growing up with Amazon and those other services where it is highly customized, right? So the expectations of the students that we're trying to serve is that we're customized now because of that, right? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so thanks a lot now. It's okay. Um, <laughs> but I mean, it is, it is kind of showing how that influences the work that we do, um, even though it's an industry kind of... Um, way of serving the customer, right? So yeah. I don't know that we've always thought of students as our customer, yes. right? Yeah, and cust I mean, yeah. I guess they do pay you sometimes, you know, in some cases for tuition, but customer is just, you know, you the customer's always right kind of thing. That's the mentality, I guess, we all kind of hear as you take on jobs or serve others, but um, customers to us are our family, our stakeholders, our members of the community. So it goes beyond just the one person, but um, mm -hmm. that's how we talk about it at Amazon. Yeah, that's great. 
Well, can I, I want to ask a follow-up question because you're in, in the technology innovation space, which is really interesting because obviously, you know, during the pandemic, we had to do a lot of pivoting in higher education and embrace technology. I think, I think we had it. We just had maybe fully embraced it. We were forced to in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was viewed as a disruptive force yeah. uh, for us. Um, but also thinking about like global competition and how we're preparing students for this global economy and, and doing a better job with that. You know, there's a lot of times people think that it might be kind of pointless to kind of plan that out because technology is just changing so rapidly. It's hard to keep up with it. So, like, what's the point of planning? There's going to be another new thing here in, like, six months. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, I don't know. Can you kind of speak to, like, how your organization kind of leans in still to planning, though, even though you, you have to have be, have be nimble, right? But, mm -hmm. like, how you're in the technology space. So, how, how do you still kind of plan and, and leverage um, that to, to implement what you're doing? Um, so I think we, we try to, well, look, I think we all had perspectives on planning and then there was a global pandemic. And so um, what's that saying? You plan and God laughs kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I think there's a little bit of that with everything these days. Um, there's always some kind of disruption. But I think for us, Again, not to harp on this, and you're going to think I'm a little bit cheesy, but I think if we, because of our um, customer obsession, like that's where the plan starts. And if those needs change, we adapt. And I think um, we've always sort of maintained that um, you can always go, come back from something. Um, with AWS in particular, the, the, the value um, on the technology that we're offering is that similar to what I mentioned about failure, like you can always come back from uh, your uh, errors in, in what you experiment with, and that's because it's a low cost technology. Um, if we think about, for example, government, you know, government has ha typically had to spend a lot of money up front to implement technology. Well, with cloud, you pay as you go. It's a utility pricing model, so the ability to experiment is um, less onerous. I think we're always, in terms of planning for what's ahead and like planning with our partnerships is we maintain the flexibility to come back and reassess our goals and objectives. Um, and I think that's really helpful. The way we see cloud, for example, as it informs the job market, um, just for the part, the employer partners we work with is that it's a foundational technology that's being incorporated more and more every day um, in things like artificial intelligence, machine learning, smart devices, smart cities, um, you know, cell phone and mobile applications, podcasting. <laughs> um, so we want to make sure that there are the building blocks and skills and tools available to people to learn the technology and adapt it for themselves is always available and relevant. And we may adjust um, the content uh, um, vehicle or mechanism which in which we do that. Mm -hmm. Great. So it's a great marriage of that. Okay, great. Well, so a little different uh, focus here that I want to take um, as we think about just like how we lead during uh, transform transformative times and also just in transforming our organizations. So you may or may not be familiar with the fact that our former governors, Bredesen and Haslam, are also hosting a podcast series right now. Uh, I have to say it's I'm a, a good big, one too. Yeah, I'm a big fan. I, I listened to it. I just They just released another one this week. Yeah, it's really good. Um, one key theme from that series is that we're at a moment in time where we need leaders who can take a principled and practical stand on the issues facing us today. So someone who can sing the song well enough that others say, yeah, that's what I want to do and what I want to be. Um, and so really it means that leaders have to define reality and say, this is an issue. But let's talk about how we can get from A to B, right? Um, and things are relatively, well, not relatively, they're politically charged, a lot of conversations these days, right? Let's just own that. So, um, David, do your time as interim chancellor, I mean, one of the major uh, disruptors that we had in the state of Tennessee was that um, we changed our governance structure. We moved the universities um, out from under TBR governance they have their own now local boards, and there's a singular focus on community and technical education. So can you talk about how you work to create win-wins for everybody in that scenario and, and align 
incentives so that individuals or institutions, uh, legislative leaders, could see the benefits of that envisioned change that was occurring? Sure. Um, you know, one of the things I think that um, gave us a big leg up into the whole sort of governance change was the fact that we had already begin this sort of student focus, student success focus. And I love to hear you talk, Maria, about the customer and uh, being so overwhelmed that they are always right. Um, that whole su student success focus, uh, Heidi, had begun and was in embedded um, into the Board of Regents uh, system prior to the discussions around uh, governance change. And so um, the notion that the, the, the system was going to look different um, did not affect necessarily the idea of the students were still going to be our focus. We were going to be entrenched in the whole notion of student success factors. It could be tangibly measured. It was just going to be delivered in a different in a different fashion. And the reason why I, I, I say it that way is governance structures can be many different ways. If you look across our country, there's many different structures and they all find a way to work. Um, but the fact that you kind of have this sort of true north around, we're going to focus on students, student success, and you can go about changing a governance structure and still have that as a focus, not just of the, your workforce elements, not just uh, a focus of your community college elements, but also the university elements. And again, you can come back and tangibly measure those successes and failures. So part of the, the discussion around the governance change had to be, let's not change our true north. Let, let's, we, we know where we're going. We're just going to deliver it in, 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 we're going to be governed in a different fashion which actually brought together some smaller units. It brought together some collaboration, particularly inside the way the system, the Board of Regents system operates now uh, in between its uh, workforce development components as well as the traditional community college components. So um, from that perspective, let me just say this, without a true north, without a student focus, without a, um, a guiding principle like that, it would have felt more like rearranging the deck chairs. But with the idea that we all, okay, we, we know what our work is, we're just doing it in, 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 a, different, in a different sort of fashion, I think made, um, made the, the, uh, the change somewhat um, uh, easier to, to accomplish. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you a follow-up question on that because, you know, again, one of the things that I value about the, the podcast series that uh, former Governor Bredesen and Haslam are, are hosting right now is, this idea of principled and practical leaders um, and taking a stand for issues. It feels like there's just a lot of hot topics out there right now that are distracting higher education from the work that they really need to do in, in serving students. So um, taking into account your years of service for the state and in a variety of roles, um, you know, what kind of advice do you have for higher education leaders today about where they should be focusing their attention as it relates to change or transformation and, and serving the student, like you said, keeping that true north? I, I want to say listen. I, I want to say listen. And, and when Maria was talking about the different changes that we've seen Amazon make to be customer responsive, mm -hmm. some of those probably came through good ideas between people sharing pizza, but others of it also came from customer feedback mm -hmm. that said, gee, could we get free two-day shipping or could we get these kinds of things? And that came from listening and responding. Now, you, you got to develop some form of thick skin because sometimes listening, when you listen, people will say things that either you don't agree with or you immediately want to explain why. Um, so, you, but, but you're wise if you listen. That doesn't mean you always change. That doesn't mean you always do everything. But the notion that you're willing to hear out 
the other person. Uh, the, 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 the podcast series you're referring to uh, has this, this guiding force, the statement from Howard Baker, listen to the other person, they might be right. That's what, in some respects, we're missing in our discourse today is uh, we're, we're not uh, engaging in, in uh, a level of discourse that um, allows us to sort of hear what the other person has to say. And um, I personally think that's unfortunate uh, because people have good ideas. People have really good ideas. Sometimes we're, we're blunting them just by, by not listening. So a, a long answer to your short question, uh, let's listen. Mm-hmm. Let's listen and hear what people have to say, and that helps you uh, adapt and adjust. Um, I think the Board of Regents has, has done a really good job in its, it, in its student focus. Um, is there more work to do? It, it, absolutely. And part of, part of the work that um, continues to, to, to be done is work we don't yet know because we're seeing what technology change right under your feet and under our feet. And so um, we, we've got to learn to listen and to adapt. Yeah. Maria, what does that look like in industry in terms of that feedback loop? And yeah, I mean, he, David mentioned, you know, it's not just about serving needs; it's hearing when things go wrong, and that's just as important to us um, at Amazon and at AWS. Um, we want to be responsive to the adjustments our customers need and our stakeholders need, um, and that's why, with, through our TBR partnership, for example, um, I emphasize that it's meant to be iterative. Um, we don't nec- we're not experts in how to teach or be educators. We're experts in the technology, and to be focused on student success means we need to work with our partners within the institutions, whether that's you know head of faculty or head of curriculum, or um, you know student affairs organizations, to make sure that um, that that our expertise can be distilled or offered in a way that resonates with the student to be successful. Um, we're also we work, um, you know, we listen to employers. Um, we want to make sure people get jobs when they go through some of our programs or in any of our workforce development programs, whether it's with AWS or Amazon. And our employers have perspectives on that. And that sometimes actually creates not challenges for us, but illuminates that there are challenges to, um, you know, market conditions or uh, marketing. You know, mm-hmm. how do we talk about jobs and skills? Um, you know, incentives, um, you know, how do you get, uh, you know, we talk about upskilling, reskilling, people who are newer in a field experience. Um, you know, I went to law school, you know, was painstakingly uh, trying to be a lawyer. I graduated, I passed the bar, and I applied for jobs, and they would say, but you have no legal experience. And I <laughs> wanted to cry. <laughs> like, what have I been doing? Um, and I have a lot of student debt now, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> so please give me this job. But um, getting that first experience is really important. So we've heard a lot about, you know, employers say, well, we need these new learners to have relevant projects. So we work with um, in- institutions to develop opportunities for capstone projects. Um, we help the students, you know, maybe provide in some partnerships a little bit more counseling or mentorship through either AWS employees or other employer em- uh, employees, employer partner employees. Um, so it, I think listening is is critically important to success and mm-hmm. just, you know, governance should be modeled after who's most critically, who most critically matters, I think. Mm-hmm. So again, David, you were, I mean, you were right there with yeah. several governors, uh, you know, kind of hearing the conversation of industry coming to the governor's office and, and making requests. I mean, what are the kind of things that you would hear that maybe were like, oh, I didn't know that, you know? Yeah. So, so let me take my chancellor hat off for yeah. just a minute and talk a little bit. Uh, uh, I had both sort of legislative experience and then um, prior to that, I had uh, executive experience, and um, y- a, l- a lot of the complaints was this sort of misalignment that uh, Maria's already um, uh, alluded to a little bit that we need th- we need this, but they can't provide that, and uh, they aren't listening, and a, a lot of um, a-, a lot of um, what you think depends upon where you sit, mm. and so. Um, there, there was this sort of idea that higher ed 
wanted to be over here and sort of leave me alone. There's a little bit of we know what we're doing and we've been doing it well for a long time. So um, just kind of leave me alone. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, Heidi, when I spoke about the, the focus on student success um, prior to the governance structure, w- one of the things that 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 did was it lined us up well with what the administrative leaders, the governors thought we ought to be doing as well as the legislative leaders thought what we were. So, so it wasn't just a singular um, board of regents kind of uh, notion. Um, it helps so much when you're going for budget requests to see that we're aligning our workforce, our education uh, mission with what you think we need to be doing. And uh, when that alignment sort of uh, occurs, then uh, all of a sudden you feel like that everybody's starting to pull on the rope together, as opposed to we're having to sort of defend why we are what we, what we are. We're fortunate in Tennessee that we've had <clears throat> multiple governors who have placed uh, education as a, uh, a, a very singular priority. And because of that, resources have been able to come in, uh, into the system. Uh, certain governors have uh, emphasized certain aspects of education over, over others, but they have clearly um, demonstrated through their uh, priority commitments that we're important. And again, I, I think part of that goes back to the fact that we have, we have aligned ourselves with what they think we need to be doing. I hate to put it crudely, we need more. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we need more people with credentials, and we can all debate about what kind of credentials those those, those are. But when you look at the at the mega data, Tennessee still remains as a state that, you know, when compared to certain peers, we're we're still an undereducated state, and we need uh, degree credential uh, credential production mm-hmm. increase. Um, one thing. I work in government relations on behalf of AWS, and just to go to your point about interacting with legislators and hearing what they have to say, um, and a part of listening is, you know, we're a technology company that can help achieve a lot of different things, and we have, even within just AWS, so many different parts of our business. It's not just about cloud technology. We have an infrastructure business, a sustainability group. Um, we support customers. There's so much going on, and so, When we meet with legislators, they are interested in cloud computing and the jobs that that can bring, but we often hear legislators who represent communities where it's, that's not what matters to them. They don't need, you know, a thousand coders in their community. They need people who can, you know, pivot on construction jobs or help meet demands for, you know, infrastructure improvements that are coming down the line. And so... We hear those needs too, and we try to develop programs and support educational systems in developing opportunities there. You know, what might seem technology adjacent, but is incredibly supportive to how we support and grow business for our customers. Um, You know, we talk, we all know broadband was really important during the pandemic, and uh, many people came to us to say, what do you do on connectivity? And there's a lot that Amazon and AWS do, does on connectivity, but how do you help people kind of plan for jobs that will be needed to build out 5G or other types of broadband deployment? And so our company thinks a lot about those people as well, beyond just the computer programmer, cloud practitioner type of person. Right. It's, yeah, much bigger enterprise than yeah. in what you're involved with. That's great. I want to talk a little bit more about students, and um, we've touched on that, you know, being very student-focused and treating students in a very customizable way um, and their mindsets. So, you know, something that we've been thinking a lot about in recent years is student mindset and motivation, um, particularly, you know, as enrollment has dropped and, you know, where students and in, in thinking about higher education and, and what the opportunities might be available to them. Um, and there's strong consensus even among employers that the development of a student's mindsets, their aptitudes, their dispositions towards work are really essential for their success. So when we think about how we build um, bridges between in the curriculum, between the curriculum and the co-curriculum, like what you do outside the classroom that supports those outcomes that would enable a student 
to flourish, you know, in a career, um, in their journeys, you know, beyond our institutions, and maybe they come back to us later for reskilling. Um, I want us to think about, you know, in your spaces, what that looks like, um, you know, observations, um, also about like how best we should be linking our curriculum, right, to achieve those things. It's not just about the content, but it also might be those other pieces of, of preparing a worker to, to enter um, the workforce. So um, I'll throw it out to either one of you to answer this, but I mean, really, like, what are your thoughts, you know, based on your, pers you know, different perspectives you've had, uh, situations about how to, to make that happen for students, linking that in classroom with the out of classroom? Please. Uh, let's just take a swing at this first. Um, first of all, let's just acknowledge that our analytic tools uh, that have come to higher education are much better than they have ever been before. They probably don't rival AWS yet, but that, we, so, so we understand much better about the student and their ability to, to succeed than, um, than we have before. Uh, that also means we understand the students who are um, at high risk better than we did before. It was not long ago. It, it's just been just not all that long ago that we would put people in a developmental education class in, in August because they were deficient in mathematics and we'd spit them out at Christmas time and they didn't have any credit and we weren't sure if they had, it, it, we, we, we determined whether they passed or failed the class. And um, if they didn't, then we likely didn't see them uh, uh, anymore. We, we understand so much better and our services are a lot more intensive uh, about that uh, now. Uh, I, I say that, Heidi, because, and this is, I don't know if this is necessarily part of the answer to your question or not, but there is an intangible um, c confidence factor that uh, students come to us with, and oftentimes it's lack of confidence, and loss, oftentimes it is exhibited in first generation college going students. And let's not, let's just don't forget that in, in this world that is so fast moving that uh, it can still be a, a, a scary place. That's why I'm such a huge uh, advocate uh, for things like dual enrollment and even advanced placement, other type things. Not, not so much that it gives the student some credits coming in, which is a great thing. But if they can get confidence that they can do college work, that's a, that's a, a big deal. So I guess the, the first thing I want, I want to put up is the idea of uh, let's, uh, let's continue to understand more and more about our students and how we can instill confidence if, that, if that's what's needed. The other thing which I think more directly uh, answers your question is the idea of helping that student figure out early on uh, what they think they want to do from what they want to do uh, or really a, a good at is um, is a critical piece. Internships are wonderful. Internships are great. I have a, a story that's real close to our family about a young man went to Auburn University and he uh, uh, wanted to be an engineer and he got to the the semester between his uh, in his senior year and he did an internship and he hated engineering <laughs> so when he got out of the classroom and he got into the workforce he pivoted and went uh, and became got an MBA he, 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 he knew that was really where he wanted to be the quicker you can figure those things out the the, the better off uh, we are let me let me let Maria chime mm -hmm. in here no I, I really loved everything you're saying you're saying about um, student confidence and enabling that I think one part of it is um, you know how do we reach students um, and I actually like to use the word learner as opposed to student, because when you think of student, you think of a young person, but we're all at a point where we are able to learn. And um, for the technology journey, there are many people who are technologists, but have been uh, excluded from being part of forward thinking technology, and they still have opportunities to learn new skills regardless of whatever age or stage they're at. So one thing we do is we make sure that we provide every learner with uh, modality that serves them. Um, this kind of goes counter to my point because I'm going to talk about younger, you know, more younger student or learner when I say this. But um, you know, we have, for example, the cloud practitioner certificate that's forming the foundation of 
um, some of one of our offerings here at TBR, um, we've put in uh, a gaming sequence called um, Cloud Quest. Um, so students can use video game to learn cloud computing, and they can then qualify to take the AWS Cloud Practitioner Certificate. Um, and that just helps maybe a certain person or group of people uh, learn better. Um, we offer online or um, self-paced. We offer in-classroom. Um, we offer dual enrollment. So I think when you provide an opportunity to someone and meet them where they are, it does help build um, their confidence in knowing that it's attainable to them. Um, I do think opportunities for apprenticeships and internships and providing practical experience is really critical. Um, we know that students need to have applicable, they need to have out of classroom sort of experiences or apply the skills they learn outside and employers are looking for that. Um, I think, and this is more of a, a personal anecdote, um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I'm, uh, I was an well. I was an international studies major, a lawyer, uh, and now I'm a technology lobbyist. And mm -hmm. I did not have any hard science um, degree, but um, I think one thing that's important is, and this kind of goes to your um, ex the example of your close family friend. You can be in technology and not have a technology job. And I think we need to emphasize to people that there are skills you can learn, whether it's on cloud or, you know a language or whatever it is that can be parlayed into a, a career that's fruitful and exciting and, um, you know, pays the bills and sustains your family. And uh, so I think that's really part, important part is, you know, in, in you need marketing professionals at a technology company. You need marketing professionals at a university. You need lawyers, accountants, uh, PR professionals, some of those soft skills still resonate in um, sort of a hard science or STEM focused um, profession so or entity. So I think it's just encouraging people to not be um, overwhelmed or discouraged from going out there and getting opportunities. Mm -hmm. well, that's a great point. And I think e maybe even more because sometimes the we need translators between technology and people who yeah. aren't so technical. Storytellers. Yeah, storytellers. I like that. Well, I have to ask a question related to, again, this concept of motivation and mindset, but maybe more of a spiritual side to the students. So um, people might not know that you're a minister also. So I have to take this opportunity to, to ask a question of, of you in terms of how do we um, maybe support faith-based endeavors that also raise up our communities um, when we think about maybe um, providing mentorship to to stu potential students, uh, learners, uh, encourage them to pursue uh, their life's dream, or you know, getting out of a particular situation and proving themselves. How do how do we, uh, as institutions, support kind of that spiritual development, that recognition that there's more to life, right, and our purpose? Uh, I'll, I'll answer that question. I, I don't know. How are we doing on time? I have a We're little okay. I have a little story, but I don't know if I should tell it or not. Just Go based on it. time, you know. Um, you just listening to you ask that question made me think very, very early on in my career. And this will this is a piece that not, not many people know about me, but uh, my one of my early jobs uh, in government was a, an investigator. And I would look into the practices of doctors and nurses and dentists who were practicing outside of the scope of their practice. Um, I, I carried a badge. Mm. <laughs> I had an undercover car. Wow. Um, and um, it was an incredibly eye-opening experience to me. But when you talk about kind of a little bit of the intersection of faith and um, what you do, I, I got asked one day, to um, look into the practice of a gentleman who was practicing chiropractic medicine without a license. And uh, in doing so, uh, oftentimes I would go undercover. Sometimes I would go undercover and try to get uh, prescriptions, doctors to write me a prescription for this, that, 
Other. I'm sweating. <laughs> 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 and, and, and on this particular day, um, I was asked to go into a chiropractic <laughs> office <laughs> and to receive treatment for somebody who possibly didn't have a license. And so um, as, I, as I sat in the waiting room um, waiting to be treated, I could hear groans in the background, which didn't make me feel very, no. <laughs> very comfortable at all. But it came my turn, and they called me. Uh, to go back and, and receive treatment. And um, what did I do? Um, I, I made up the biggest lie I could think of. You know, I'm, oh, I, I like to play basketball. And, you know, last night I was in a pickup basketball game and I went up for a layup. Somebody undercut my legs. I fell on my back. Oh, gosh, my back is killing me. My back felt fine, you know. Uh, but, but it made me think, okay, here I am. It, 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 is God, God pleased with me now? Because I'm definitely not telling, <laughs> not telling the truth. And I've used that story many times because I always think, I've used it more in church than I have in settings like this, thinking about uh, just sort of, okay, am I an agent of the government, which is what I can, considered myself to be, and is it okay? How else are we going to get to the truth unless we uh, figure out this, this story? Uh, sorry for that little aside, but you made me think about that when you asked me the question. Um, I, I am a person of faith, and I have been for uh, uh, my life. But it, it, it's, it, to me, it was always important that you, you don't try to drive some kind of agenda through your job. And I'd say that about religion or, 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 or anything else, that you, you don't try to get on a stump because I feel a certain way, and then you try to move that through uh, through, through, through various policies or whatever direction you're giving. However, um, it does color who you are as a person. And when, when I think about uh, uh, Jesus talking about that he came not uh, to be served but to serve others, then that colors my opinion of what kind of leader I thought I ought to be. And so I, I don't apologize at all for sort of internalizing spirituality into me as a worker. What I never wanted to do, though, was sort of take and drive some particular item or agenda and force it into my work in some aspect. Mm -hmm. Right or wrong, that's kind of the approach that I mm -hmm. I was just going to say, even though cloud... Um, provides like imagery of heaven and you know, religion. <laughs> I don't have a, I don't have anything for you on AWS yeah, yeah, and no. uh, <laughs> spirituality, okay. faith in the job. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. No, I just think you know in the in the, again, we're we're discussing themes from the book, disruptive transformation, and there's an element of this concept. They talk about the spiritual development of an individual, how that you know you find your life's purpose and. Um, how that can also, I was just thinking in connection to students, because we find so many of them maybe struggling with that right now, and maybe that's demotivating in and of itself. So we, you know, we're just talking about, like, how do we get students to engage in, in higher education or finding a different route um, yeah. of possibility? And so I, um, I'm in my 30s, so I'm not, like, knowledgeable beyond my years, but I have um, had I'm some sweating <laughs> now. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm still surprised growing up in the generation that I have that a lot of young people feel um, stymied by getting to a certain age. Like, I didn't uh, do this. I didn't achieve this. Or um, things are going awfully wrong because I haven't done X, Y, Z. And I probably remember people in my life telling me, like, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. Don't worry about it. And... Um, I didn't believe them, but I see that so much more clearly now. Like, I had a lot of setbacks in my professional development and career um, that felt very catastrophic. But if I look back now, obviously hindsight is twenty twenty. Um, all of those set setbacks actually like got me to my career. It's not linear. The learning experience isn't linear, and learning goes beyond the classroom. And you can always pivot. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know because of the work of college, college systems and like community college systems in particular, um, you make 
you know, pivoting so much easier. And I think that that should provide students with some confidence of like, you can always learn something new. Um, we talked about learning on TikTok just at the, before the podcast started. There's so many ways to, to learn and get interested in something. And so if in this chapter, while you're at a university or a community college, um, you're learning something, that chapter might inform something 10, 20 years down the line. Um, you know, engineers make wonderful business professionals. Um, they, so many engineers get their MBAs and that probably isn't go hand in hand for some people, but um, yeah, you can always pivot. Yeah. Great. So I always like to ask my panelists at the end of the conversation, if you have one key takeaway that you wanna leave with listeners about this topic of transformation, leadership, what would it be? <laughs> um, I think in the sp spirit of Amazon and AWS, um, you know, one of our leadership principles is learn and be curious. Um, and I think that that is a great way to go through life and building an organization. Um, you know, there are so many questions in our world that we have to answer. Um, and they're changing all the time. The conditions are changing all the time. And um, everyone comes with different experiences. So it's important to be curious and learn about those experiences, learn about the conditions as they're evolving. And I think as you, if you focus on that, you'll, you'll get to some really awesome innovations, answers, and um, great stories. Great. Thank you. Embrace change. And you mentioned earlier at the very outset, Heidi, you said, you know, it, it, it's, it's difficult oftentimes for us to, um, to embrace change. But in the world that we're, we're living in now, those people who are adaptable, uh, who can understand that things are not going to be static, and if you can, and, and, and for many of us, myself included, change a mindset where you can be comfortable in embracing new ways and new things. Um, and I'm not talking about being irresponsible. I'm talking about being willing n to listen, to think, and, and to accept change. I like, to, I like to think of it in the concept of we, we, we still have a true north. We know where we're going. We know we're about the student. We know we're about success. But the modalities underneath that are all up, they're, 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 they are changing. And it, it, the more you can embrace that, the happier a person you're going to be, I think the better off to the organization uh, you are, are, are likely to be. Um, and, um, and, and it probably takes, uh, in, in many of us, a change of mindset. And I've really enjoyed this conversation today. Thank you, Maria and David, Thank for you. your contributions. Can I just say that, that not just today, but the other two uh, conversations, yeah. I, it's, uh, congratulations to you and uh, to the TBR for doing this. I think it's fantastic. A, a new thing for us, too. A new thing. I like it. <laughs> We're experimenting. So thank you for your time today. Thanks, Columbia State, for hosting us on your campus. Uh, look for this uh, follow-up podcast series in spring of 2023. We're going to also be carrying on this work with another book and more conversations with faculty and staff across the system. So look for that. And again, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this edition of From the VC's Bookshelf, brought to you by TBR, the College System of Tennessee, powering the state's economy and changing the lives of thousands of graduates starting successful careers each year. To learn more about upcoming book selections or to register to attend discussions live, visit tbr.edu bookshelf.